welcome and happy Sabbath. We're glad that you could join us this morning as we share in the Word of God. Uh, the name uh, and title of the sermon today is Cleansing the Living. There is um, a work of cleansing that the Lord is doing in our lives, and we have many messages that talk about how in Daniel 8.14 that it says that the sanctuary will be cleansed. We know that that is not only the heavenly sanctuary, but the sanctuary, the temple of our souls, where in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6 and chapter 6 and chapter 3, it talks about how we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we want that cleansing in our lives. We want that ministry that Jesus wants to do for us in our lives. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to be with us as we uh, communicate these truths. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are here with us, that you love us deeply, and that you want to cleanse us, our soul temples and the heavenly sanctuaries, so that the work will be finished. The work that you've begun in us, the work that you began ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, that you want to finish this work in us. <clears throat> And we just pray that we'll cooperate, Lord, and that we'll listen to you and follow you as you want to do that in our lives. Pray that you will forgive me of all of my sins and all of us of our sins and cleanse us deeply in the hidden areas of our life so that we can be set free from any area the enemy wants to try to have control. And we just pray. You would just speak through me now your words and not my own. I'm a little emotional today, but um, the Lord will help us as we read and study about these things. And so we want to start in, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 61, and, and just take a look at um, how Jesus wants to heal the brokenhearted. And in a special way in these last days, he wants to heal the brokenhearted. And this text is the one that Jesus read, and I think it's in Luke chapter 4, that Jesus read in, um, as he stood up in the synagogue and they handed him a scroll and he read this and he said, um, today this is um, fulfilled in your hearing or in, in at this time and that he was pointing to himself as the savior as the shepherd as the rescuer of his people Israel and of course he was not coming as the hero king at that time he is our hero king and he will come the second time and do battle for us as he rescues us from planet earth and I was reading um, this morning or yesterday how the angels are going to come down like when he comes in the clouds the angels are going to come and rescue us and raise us up off this earth because this is going to be a battle but at the time he was coming he was uh the first time he was doing the battle and the rescue of our souls uh from the from sin and from how heavy that burden is for us and how the enemy is always trying to break our hearts from the time we're conceived until our death. And Jesus wants to rescue us in a special way because many of us are not going to see death because it is time for Jesus to come again. And he's going to take many of us off the planet without seeing death. And he wants to finish this healing process in our hearts uh, of our broken hearts. But here in Isaiah 61, let's just read. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, and to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. 
They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And so we, oh, even the next verse is good. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the uh, ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. I hadn't really seen this for a really long time. That that's what God is trying to do to the third and fourth generation. Long devastated family lines of um, sin and havoc that has been passed down to us. And how he wants to heal and restore and give us a garment of praise instead of despair. And he wants to comfort all of us who mourn and are broken hearted. And that's what Jesus came to do the first time. And he wants to finish the work. He didn't get to finish it. He didn't get to do it for all the people. And he would heal them physically and he would touch them. And the leprosy was gone and the blind could see. And yes, he would forgive them of their sins. And he did heal their hearts and they followed him in, in many ways. But there's a final way that he wants to do this in the most holy place where there was even deeper and deeper sins that each one of us have been infected by the bite of that serpent. And he, wanted, he was yet to even be lifted up. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. And so he was lifted up and he shed his blood for us. And he has done so much for humanity in this power to heal the brokenhearted and his power to set us free, not just from prisons, um, literal prisons, though many of us would want to see our loved ones freed or we ourselves to be freed from, from prison, but also the prison of sin, the prison of discouragement or despair, those kinds of prisons we want to be released from. And the neat thing about the sanctuary, and in many of our series we talk about the courtyard and how that's where Jesus was crucified in the um, second one of the, the altar of sacrifice and his blood is forgiveness of sin and the laver where we have baptism and, and then in the holy place where we have the sanctified walk with Jesus and we have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and eating the bread of life to be renewed with the mind of Christ. But in the most holy place is where our books are to be opened. Do you remember that? In Daniel 7, where I've shared that before, where there's that judgment scene when Jesus goes into the most holy place where our books are opened and the court is seated and the judgment is set. And so our books are going to cleanse not only uh, some of the sins in that book, but all of the sins that he wants to do now that he's opened the book and he can fix it and he can go all the way back to the beginning where the roots of bitterness have started and all the way back to womb experiences for some people um, that have been very devastating, some more than others in the womb. But Jesus wants to heal all those hidden and secret things that have happened. And let's just look at Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 and 14. Um, there I have so many, and I love reading so many of these texts about hidden and secret. You just go ahead and check on, on uh, concordances, uh, be it on your phone or in a real concordance, and you look up hidden and secret, and it's like, wow, there's a lot in the Bible that talks about this. This is really awesome. And that's the most holy place. Is that not the secret place of God? The most holy place, that's where for us as temples, it's our soul in the deepest part of our soul is that most holy place experience for us. And in there is hidden and secret things. And the NIV in this verse says hidden things. In the King James, it says secret, where we read in 13, of course, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And the commandments, of course, are in the most holy place. It looks like a little heart. I say this often. If you trim the edges of the Ten Commandments, it looks like a little heart. It's God's heart of love. Where we're supposed to be uh, 
putting him first and worshiping him in every way and, and, and not uh, cursing him, but saying praise to him. And it's also the heart of love to other people where we're not going to um, hurt them. We're not going to kill anybody. We're not going to criticize or lie to anybody with false witness, uh, witnessing about them and that we're not going to covet and we're not going to commit adultery and many other things there. We're going to be loving to one another. It's the heart of love in the deepest part of the Ark of the Covenant. And he wants to write that law of love in our hearts, in our most holy place, in our soul is where he wants to write those things in the hidden place. Then it says, for God will bring every deed into judgment. Okay, and we just talked about the judgment with the books being open in Daniel 7. So here of verses 9 and 10. And so here God's going to bring every deed uh, into judgment in our books. Okay, every page is right here. But remember from other sermons that we've talked about, it's a process. That's when he opens our book. It's the beginning, not the end of the judgment for us. It's the beginning. And he is our Savior. Then as he goes over these things, he's going to wash them all clean as he brings them to us. And we're going to listen to him speaking to us about the these judgment things that are hidden, the secret things that are there. And then he can cleanse with the blood of Jesus anything that we confess. If we confess our sins that he brings to us that are in the books, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the next part of the verse says, including, he's going to bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden or secret thing, whether it is good or evil. And praise God in the great controversy in chapters 23, 24, and 28, Ellen White talks about how when this happens, that good things are brought out too. Um, we spend more time with the bad things because we're trying to get a bath, we're trying to get cleaned up, but the good things are brought out and the good things in our character that God has planted there. But then if there's anything that's evil, that's hidden, and secret. And I want to suggest that one of the reasons, there are several reasons why it's hidden and secret. One is because it may not be a specific deed that uh, is easy for us to pinpoint. Like I lied, um, which was not a habit for me. It would only happened a few times in my life that I ever remember or that the Lord brought up. Um, that I, but I did lie to my professor in college about a book that I read. He, he wanted to know if I had read the whole book and I said that I didn't and I hadn't. I just had read just barely enough to answer the questions and do a report and so I lied to him about that and I um, later and I wasn't really walking with the Lord at that time in my life and but I still felt guilty about it because lying was not a part of something I did and um, generally and so it really bothered my conscience and finally after like a year or two it was down in my subconscious enough that later the Lord when he opened my book he reminded me of that lie and that was one of those deeds that needed to be brought out and I confessed that and um, Jesus cleansed me and forgave me and I didn't even remember the name of the professor so I couldn't go back and apologize to him but I was prepared if I needed to but that, that's an easier thing to bring out for the Lord, a deed that has happened. But Jesus wants to go even deeper into our subconscious mind, which kind of is where things that have happened in the womb and the first three and a half years of life or so that are forgotten. Do you remember when you were two? Do you remember when you were one? Do you remember being in the womb? No, but all those things are written in our brains. All the uh, emotions that happen then are stored in our amygdala. They're hidden and secret to us. And Jesus says he wants to bring, including every hidden secret thing, whether it is good or evil. So he wants to bring these kinds of things of maybe just negative emotions that have set the ground uh, work for roots in our life, negative roots to develop. We have positive roots, but then we have the negative ones that have developed in our lives that have affected us for 
our whole life. And there's a study about the amygdala that's just really fascinating about how all those things are stored there and that if some incoming information presently, currently happens that reminds us of something that has happened before, it can trigger us and we'll have the same reaction or maybe more so because there's accumulation of the same thing happening to us over and over throughout our lives that began way back in the beginning. And so God um, wants to heal those oh, broken areas that have happened to us so we can be set free from the prison of our own negative experiences and negative emotions that have happened to us. And then we can just come to Jesus and go through the steps of the sanctuary and have them cleansed away with the garment of praise is step number one. Then we can confess any of those negative emotions that even, even if it's just merely that we confess believing the lie of the enemy, something negative about us or something negative about somebody else, that we can allow the Lord to help us to forgive ourselves for things that may not have even been our fault, but when we're babies, we blame ourselves when bad things happen. Um, and when we're children, the same thing, we can blame ourselves. So we need that forgiveness and that freedom from that. But also we may feel angry or upset at, at, at our parents or um, at other individuals that have hurt us when we were children. He wants to cleanse even these deep emotional things in our lives in the cleansing of the living and those, this last generation that we can participate and come into harmony with. I have down here also Isaiah 49 and Psalm 27 that talk about Jesus um, replacing any area. We'll just review those very quickly. Replacing any area that happened between us and our parents that was hurtful. And our parents did not mean to hurt us. And the, the, the many situations even happen, I know in my life, where the parents weren't doing anything hurtful or wrong, but the enemy misinterpreted based on something that I felt hurt about. And the enemy comes in and misinterprets those things into the negative. And Jesus, no matter which way it happens, he can heal us. So we have Isaiah 49. Um, 13 through 16, shout for joy. So we're praise again, which is the step one in the sanctuary. O heavens, rejoice, O earth, and burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. We've all been afflicted by the enemy, by Satan, way back from the beginning. And Ellen White says that, that, uh, Children are the lawful prey of the enemy. So the enemy has come in and afflicted us. No matter what the parents meant to do or didn't mean to do, we have been afflicted. And Jesus is the solution. And he has compassion on us. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. How many of us feel that when we're in a trial? We're being afflicted again. And our amygdala is being triggered. And Jesus says, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the ch child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraven you on the palms of my hands and your walls are ever before me. Walls mean protection. Zechariah 2 verse 3 through 5 talks about <coughs> walls being protection, protection. And some of us have been in very dysfunctional families where those walls of protection were broken down. Some have been uh, beaten, some have been molested, and many other things that have happened. Those are extremes, but even the gradations. Enemy has broken in through walls of protection and has hurt our souls. And Jesus say, says, your walls are ever before me, and he's going to build up the walls of Jerusalem. He's going to build up the walls of Zion and protect us completely. So much so that when Jesus comes again, we will have complete and utter trust in him through all that is happening on this planet Earth. But we need those walls to be built up and healing to take place in our hearts before we're prepared for those final events of Earth's history. Then Psalm 27, 
kind of goes a little bit with that too, where in verse, and this is where he applies it also um, to the sanctuary. This all of 27 is just so powerful. And it brings the temple or the sanctuary right into it. And it says, um, verse 4, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. This is where we need to get into the temple, the sanctuary in the most holy place under His wings and be pr protected and kept safe. For in the day of trouble, or in the time of trouble, according to some versions, in the time of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the secret place in New King James or NIV, the shelter of his tabernacle. That's our hiding place where we're going to be protected in the secret place. And he set and set me high upon a rock. And then a little bit further down, it says, <clears throat> verse 9, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. So this is, again, the Lord wants to heal any broken areas in our childhood that have happened. And again, it's not to blame parents um, because often they haven't even done anything, but the enemy has come in like a flood and tried to affect us. So, um, everything is to be restored um, from, that has been stored in the amygdala. And in order to do that, Jesus is going to take us through experiences as he's opened our books here. He's going to take us through experiences that are going to trigger us. Fiery trials, 1 Peter 4.12 says, fiery trials are going to come in our lives so that he can bring up what is hidden and secret in our hearts. He's going to bring it out of our subconscious. He's going to bring it out of the amygdala and bring it into the present day. And then we are to run to Jesus and work it through and try to say, uh, Lord, help me to understand the deeper reasons why I am acting and reacting this way and that this is a pattern in my life. I want to be set free and healed on the deepest levels possible. And um, then I just had wanted to say that for many of us, um, maybe that we have had wonderful child, uh, childhood. And it's really hard to remember anything that is, has been a problem. And praise God for those people who are on that end of the spectrum. We know that then many of us are more in the middle where, yes, there's a few things that we can remember, etc., cetera, um, and, and uh, God can, can reveal those. Then there's those who've had very traumatic ch childhoods with many um, very damaging things that it takes a little longer, but Jesus is that great, great healer. And just like he healed Mary Magdalene, who um, had a lot of pain in her heart, that he was able to heal and forgive to the uttermost, no how, matter how deep uh, the scars have been from the enemy. So whatever, wherever you find yourself in the a spectrum, I do want to say this, that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Each one of us have sin, and sin goes back to fear. Uh, at the core is going to be fear, and all of us have experienced fear or some a measure of it in some way or another. This started in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve where uh, uh, sinned and they experienced that fear. And every human after that have had areas where we've had fear. Um, when we have fear, we cover it up and self-protect, which is sinful coping mechanisms, with anger, with walls, around us of protection. Now we're supposed to have good walls of protection and we probably have some of that but we also have walls of self-protection where we guard ourselves and we push people out and we don't feel safe and protected and, um, and we don't have Jesus being our wall instead in those places. Another way that we cope is through withdrawing. 
withdrawing emotionally, being shut down um, in, in self-protection uh, in that way. Any kind of thing revolved around self and protecting the self is all in an attempt to cope with fear, which um, is as a result also of pain. And the Lord wants to lead each one of us how uh, to work through these things. I don't know a lot of people that have reported that they, you know, have one of these super perfect uh, upbringings in, upbringing in childhood. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the Lord works with some of those. But for most of us that I have ever talked to, we can pinpoint to times where we have felt fear, where we have felt depression or discouragement in one way or another. And we can see patterns in our childhood and youth where the enemy has attacked. And so the Lord wants to um, pinpoint that and walk with us together to pinpoint those areas and to open it up. And at first, it might, we might feel vulnerable. We might feel vulnerable and we want, we need the Lord's covering and protection during this surgery because he is the great physician. And he is going to do some surgery and he's going to cut into our hearts just a little bit. But we need to trust him. He has anesthesia on board. He's going to be covering us the whole time. And we can trust him through everything he takes us through. And we can be open and talk with him and listen to what he has to show us. But just be open to listening as he wants to take us back into childhood. Don't close that door and say, oh, I don't want to think about the past. That's all happened in the past, etc. Yes, but what if it's the same thing you're experiencing presently and it has clues to help you um, break open <laughs> that situation for you and give you insights the Holy Spirit wants to reveal. And that's where I want to share maybe a couple of stories that can help. Um, I know that it's very easy, especially if, um, if you've never tried to break through into uh, past areas and seeing um, patterns before. Um, I know for me, I've even, you know, I work with children and so I can see those patterns um, over a long period of time. You get to know children and you see things that have happened when they were babies or children and then you see that as they grow and it works through the, uh, in the classroom, it works through um, into their adulthood. You see these patterns um, that happen and of course the Lord has shown me many in my, my own. But it's really easy when we look at behavior to condemn ourselves, to condemn others, to say, well, you know, they have a choice to do it right, and they do have a choice, um, and, and we can feel condemning to them. And we also can feel that Jesus condemns us and has that condemning spirit towards us because we fall again and again in a certain situation. But when he opens up how he really feels and how much mercy and grace he sees in his heart. When he shows you the pattern, you're like, oh, and you see how he has mercy. He weeps for us for what we've suffered and gone through. He wants to hold us like a shepherd with a lamb, like a father with a child, like a mother with a child to heal the brokenness. He is not feeling condemning when, um, when he sees us have patterns of behavior that we don't feel good about and that we know, we know it's sin, he knows it's sin, but let's let him heal the root and where it goes back to. So it's just interesting. I was talking with somebody one time and I'm going to try to ch share this story as vaguely as possible to protect the innocent, um, but just to say that uh, she was just sharing with me how there was this way that she relates to people that um, she doesn't feel comfortable with and she knows that it's really not best the way that she relates and she has tried for many times over the years that and she does better for a while and then um, she's in a certain situation or whatever and then she'll kind of just do again what she had had this pattern and just kind of just happens and she sees that it's really not the best way to relate to people and um, and so she just was trying to figure out why that would be. And so as we talked, um, it was discovered that she was 
uh, had come from a larger family of children, um, and larger than normal, you know, for especially in America, a larger number of children. And I was like, hmm, where are you in the birth order? <laughs> I was not surprised to find out that she was smack dab in the middle, not exactly. She was actually a little younger than um, uh, the middle. So she was down way a number of kids. Um, and so she's a, a middle child with a huge group of kids. And I'm a middle child and I only have an older sister and a younger brother. So there's just three of us. But, um, and so we talked about how that middle child can, um, can kind of not be heard in the midst of things. Uh, and, and that, that they develop coping mechanisms. I said, you can even Google, uh, you know, middle child syndrome and you'll get a lot of material that comes up. And so, um, and so we, we develop different ways of trying to be heard or cope. And so that that can set up a pattern in our lives that, um, that then we're in adult situations and we may use those same coping mechanisms. And so that was very helpful. We talked about, you know, uh, how would it feel if you handled it this way? How would that feel? And it was like, ooh, you know, then, then it, you feel like you might feel abandonment. You might feel like you're never going to be heard. You might feel um, that you're not a part of the group or anyway, we just were brainstorming of different ways that you might feel if you don't use the normal coping net mechanism to, to handle the situation. So the Lord was giving some really neat ideas. And then a story came out that was just, I was like, Ooh, okay, that's, that goes right along with it. Where she was away from her parents for a while as some, you know, early grade school age, away from her parents for a while. And something um, was happening that, that was upsetting to her. And she um, went forward and spoke about it and continued to speak about it, which is unusual for children. A lot of times, you know, around adults, we, we're, we sublimate. Um, but she came forward until something happened. And her parents were able to be um, told about it and, and, and everything. And the situation was resolved. And it was like, wow, you know, that's really amazing how um, you went forward. That's unusual. And you can see how that pattern then, um, you know, there's the good side of that that happened for you to be able to move forward and speak the way that was needed to be sp spoken. But in your current life, to continue to use that pattern now, um, which is kind of can be self-protection, is not working in the day-to-day -day life. It's not working in the day-to-day -day experience. And she saw so much that, that pain that she was having and the need to express what needed to be done and that then it was, it was fixed and it was resolved and that if she hadn't moved forward that she would have um, been very hurt, very, very hurt if, if you know, it hadn't been resolved and how that is deeper emotions that are pushing her in the present all the time and um, to relate in a way that's inappropriate. She saw how it was inappropriate on the day-to-day -day relationships with, with others. And it was just like a great release and a great opening in her mind. Wow, okay, now I see where this is coming from. And God is not judging me. And before, there was more of a tendency to say, you know, I know I'm being so selfish. I know I'm being so bad. I know, I, you know, I just keep sinning over and over and the Lord must be upset. You know, and I said, no, he feels mercy because he saw what you were going through and your parents were not there to protect you. And you, you know, you were able to go forward and he saw the pain you were in and he was able to rescue you then and he wants to rescue you now. He's feeling nothing but sympathy, empathy, mercy for you. And he can heal that wounded spot in your life completely. And we walked through the, the steps in the sanctuary, applying them um, for her situation so that she could see things in a different way. She says, I am going to see this so different the next time I face this in the future when I'm relating to people. She says, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to see it so differently from now on. And um, so, and not that that's the end all, but it's the start. It's the start of being broken free from something 
that is so can be so heavy and carry on through uh, throughout childhood and 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 in her situation, I just reveal this now because she did come from a happy home as far as she could tell. And so there were so many good things that there were for her to bring into her present life. And, and she's able to be very uh, successful in her career and these kinds of things. But yet the Lord, when he opens each individual book, you know, can reveal some hidden things that are going to set everyone free, whatever walk of life that you've been through, whatever experience that you've been through. So I just want to share um, my own story, and then that, those will be the two st stories that we'll share today. Um, I just want to share a little bit about my situation and how um, in her situation, she went forward when there was an issue, and I tended to withdraw and become very inward. Um, in my soul and to be um, afraid to speak up and so the Lord had uh, kind of revealed to me this morning when I woke up uh, another layer of this situation that I hadn't seen because as clearly as I'd, I've seen it many many times but I hadn't seen it as clearly because he's cleansing me on some things that built up to this uh, those things are getting cleansed away so now I was looking at the next situation and seeing it with different eyes. So I'll go back and, and just give you a background of uh, two of the major roots in my life were the time when I was away from my mom in the hospital and it was, uh, you know, no ill on her part in any way. But while I was in the hospital, the enemy did come in and attack me and I was there for seven days. And by the time she came back, I had kind of like entered into this depression or death cycle and and the enemy's lies to me was that she was never coming back and it was my fault and that there's something wrong with me and all these negative lies that are in the subconscious that fueled um, you know dysfunction in my soul uh, through throughout my childhood and the Lord has been working very much with healing that and I praise God for that um, one of the results, as I was still a baby before the healing, one of the results was that um, I would go into crying fits every once in a while. And so normally I didn't cry at all for any, even if I was hungry or needed anything or di needed diapering. I was just a quiet and calm and cheerful little baby for the most part. And so uh, I didn't cry about things. But... And then I would, um, since the hospital time, though, I would go into these crying fits. And what the Lord had showed me um, is that I could feel, because I still, that's in my amygdala, and even as adult, I would, that cycle would happen every couple years, where there would be a buildup, and then I would feel kind of this hysteria, and feel like, you know, a crying fit coming on. And what I feel when I'm going through that is that it's impossible for me to be able to reach out and connect with anyone and that I'm not going to be heard and not going to be understood. So um, those deep emotions then are in the amygdala and need to be worked through and the, and the Lord is really helping with that. I praise God. <clears throat> so, but when I was in one of these crying fits, um, my mom and dad were together and um, she said that when I went into the crying fit, and I was just getting more and more hysterical that, uh, and she was trying to calm me down and that kind of thing, that um, my dad just felt like, you know, she needs to stop being in this crying fit. Maybe if I just shake her and, you know, just, uh, you know, help her like wake up or something, she'll, you know, snap out of this crying fit that she's in. And, you know, men have different instincts than women about babies and crying and that sort of thing anyway because they're created differently. And they want to fix and they want to help and, um, and that's awesome and that's good. My mom said he wasn't angry. He just, um, you know, even though he did have times where he was angry, this was not one of them. And so what he decided to do is to shake me upside down from my ankles. And so he's like, okay, you know. <laughs> 
like a little doll baby instead of a real human. You know, he just, he, he didn't know what to do. So, but for me, um, it scared me to death, you know, obviously, especially the Lord has showed me, especially since I was in an, in a, an extreme time of need. And usually I would try to always be calm, not only as a baby, but as an adult you know, try to be calm all the time, no matter what is happening around me. It doesn't disturb me. It doesn't bother me. I just handle it. I go with the flow. It is what it is and all of that. But when I'm in a desperate place of need, then it's like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to reach out to people. I'm going to be able to connect with them and get my needs met. So in that situation is when now I'm upside down, I'm being shaken. And in my baby mind, I really did feel like he was upset with me um, and mother says that I just went into such hysteria she thought that I was gonna die or whatever I just went into complete freak out mode and so there was just like nothing that um, she could do to calm me down until she um, made sure that both of our skin was bare and she wrapped around with a robe or a towel so that I was kind of like in the womb you know skin to skin and that all covered up like a womb experience um, and that only then over a little while I guess um, that I was a, she was able to calm me down and get me back to normal and to, to be that little rescue thing for me and my father didn't mean any any harm at all by that he was surprised that I got more upset instead of calming down <laughs> but um, and so I you know I've been able to forgive him fully um, and, and, and truly, you know, um, he wasn't trying to do anything bad, but, but anyway, but the enemy came in like a flood during that time. And Ellen White says, never shake a child. Now I was shaking upside down, never shake a child because you, well, you may shake out one demon, but you'll shake in more demons. Mm -hmm. So the devil came and reinterpreted that whole situation and caused me to feel um, very much rejected, very much hopeless, and different types of things that I have since been able to work through that scenario so that I can feel Jesus' love, I feel my Father's love, I feel my mother's love, and God has healed that place on a deep level. And I praise His name. He can even blot out, you know, any of the negative memories out of those experiences that we've had from childhood. So, but then this morning, it was really interesting that he brought up um, the next scenario, which is the rest of my life as, as um, a kind of a young child and all through grade school until probably high school level, is that I had completely uh, shut my father out of my life. I felt he couldn't be trusted, um, and it started, you know, a couple things from the womb it started in a major way from that upside down shaking and then other times that he would be angry not usually at me because I was a good kid but things were happening in the household and actually as I thought about it as an adult a lot of times he was angry because he lost stuff I didn't even think about it until I was an adult that he and he you know in, until he you know wasn't able to walk anymore he would have this way that he would be looking and he was so careful about filing everything perfectly and he was an accountant and had to have all his papers right and um and he anything whether it was his golf clubs or his golf balls or anything that he had he has lots of little things he had everything organized everything but for whatever reason i'm sure it was several times a week he would lose something and he would look through all the filing cabinets and he would look through all the closet and under the bed and everything. And finally, he'd just be so upset and stomping around the house. Where is that? So he wasn't like mad even at me. Um, he was just so frustrated with this and he didn't know that this was scaring me a lot because I didn't, you know, I wasn't putting all that together. I just knew that I was afraid of my father and when he would stomp around and be angry or kick a toy, what's this toy in the way, you know? <laughs> whatever and just doing the German thing and and all that um, it, that, it, that because of the amygdala that was triggering fear a lot of fear in me so I had shut him completely out of my life and felt you know uh, bitterness and hatred towards him and I felt like I can't trust you etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, then the Lord was reminding me this morning about how 
um, that all through my childhood that I would sit and listen to him and admire him. I, had, I really admired his intelligence and, and his abilities and he was a teacher and he was always teaching us kids at the dinner table this and that. He was always bringing the encyclopedias and the dictionaries and, and he would talk politics and he just knew so much and he loved to teach. And I would really admire him and I just really appreciate how, you know, gifted that he was and, and I thought he was special and all of these things. But then the Lord reminded me how much I, how closed down that I was and that I didn't feel like I had anything to contribute to that relationship with him. And I don't remember ever, I really don't, other than a, like two or three times, I don't ever remember speaking to him. Like I listened and listened and listened, but I, and I'm sure there were times that I did and I would just don't remember. But I never remember reaching out to speak to him and have a conversation and talk to him. He was very bonded with my sister and I felt very left out of that relationship that he had with my sister and that there, that I had nothing to offer. I, you know, and then of course he was, you know, loved my mother and he was, you know, and, and I felt like he's got mother, he's got my sister. There's no room for me. There's no place for me. And I just never tried to, to have a relationship with him. Plus the fact that I had a bitter spirit uh, and self-protection and withdrawal and all of those things. And so the Lord was just, now that I'm so much healthier on some of the deeper roots, he wanted to address this other type of area in my life of how I was shut down and that I looked down on myself and felt like I had nothing to offer to my father. And he wants to heal that even on a deeper level. And I've gone through it before. I'm not finished yet. It just came up this morning again, but, the, and he, but he was saying, I want you to see yourself the way I see you, is the way Jesus sees me, is that I do have something to offer, and he has created me with gifts that I could minister to my father and to reach out to him, because he used to say, I really wish I could get close to Karen. He would say this every once in a while. I don't know why I just can't get close to her in my hearing, he would say, and and I don't know what it would take. And he would tell Brenda that in private too. She said, I want to get close to Karen, but I had all these walls around me to, of self-protection and, and, and I felt negative about myself that was not true, it's from the enemy. And <clears throat> that he wanted, um, and Jesus wanted to not only um, heal me in adulthood, but heal that childhood part that really was shut down. Because in adulthood, my dad and I were able to develop a relationship, praise God. And we talked a lot. And we related. And I was able to share. And he would ask me questions. And he would have his clipboard with all these questions. Now, I've been thinking, Karen, I wanted to know about this, this, and this. And he would just always want to start a conversation. So we had wonderful things that happened in my adult life all the way to his passing a couple of months ago. And I praise God for that. But it did not heal the roots in the past. Even though I had this relationship in the, in the it, I did not bond with him as my father because I had already rejected and shut down. Uh, it was like it was a different person almost that I was relating to. It wasn't my father that I loved and that he loved me. It's like that bond had still not been healed. Now much was healed in the, past, in the last year before his passing. Praise God for that. Much was healed, uh, even on the emotional level and the bonding level as I ministered to him and I would bathe him and, and um, help him to get uh, you know, into the wheelchair or whatever it was, you know, I, I was there and was uh, able to heal very, very deeply. But the Lord was showing me there's still some, there's still some left of where I had shut down in my whole childhood and didn't have a relationship with him and how that has affected me then today when I relate to certain people. I have that same trigger that, oh, this person is, I can't trust. This person I can't share myself with. I have nothing to offer. You know, all those negative thought patterns are still there, were still there, and Jesus wants to cleanse it away. He wants us to go step by step with him and walk through your childhood, walk through your relationship with your father and your mother, and, and or brothers or sisters, 
or other family members or you know some people have to deal with a maybe a neighbor that molested them or something that's not a family member but whatever it is Jesus can walk through those and rewrite the story rewrite everything the way he wanted it to be the way he sees it and the way he wants us to connect with his thoughts about it and about me I want to connect in a new way with his thoughts about how I do have something to contribute. I do have things, uh, gifts that God has given me that I can connect with my father and other people like my father. So I just wanted to share these two ways of handling things. The one lady, you know, went forward, praise God, and, and was able to find healing even as a child with moving forward. And I had stepped back and had put walls around. And that either way, God wants to heal our hearts to the deepest depths of our souls. So I just want to give every one of you hope, hope that Jesus can do this as we listen to his voice wanting to remind. It's not something that, you know, we just um, try to do a lot of digging around. We need to do some, just be willing to look at our past and see. But we um, pray and ask the Lord to bring some of these things up. This was something he brought up this morning that I had no idea that he wanted to talk about. That was generated by him. And those thoughts as I woke up in the morning, I just remember sitting at the table as a child, listening to my father and, uh, you know, and feeling afraid to share or feeling afraid to have a relationship with him. And he wants to heal that fear from my life. So <clears throat> I just uh, encourage you that as you go forward, that God can use the sanctuary steps, the sanctuary model for cleansing us in every particular of our hearts and our minds. And our text, this, um, oh, I have two texts actually in, in closing, but our text, our scripture text this morning was Malachi 4. But before we turn to that, I would like to turn to Hosea. Hosea is such a beautiful book of healing and Jesus wanting to heal us of deep, deep things that have hurt us. And so I'm going to read in um, one portion, which is Hosea 14. <clears throat> and it says, starting with verse 1, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. I think that's interesting. We need to take words. We need to come let us reason together um, and reason with the Lord with words to help us to be able to return to the Lord in a deeper way than we ever have before. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Verse 4, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom with like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send shoots, send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. So we want new roots to go down. Um, and so that I can blossom like a, a lily. I can't blossom like a lily if I still have issues between me and my father that need to be resolved. But we want new roots and that's where it says he will send down his roots. He's the root of Jesse, uh, Isaiah 11. Jesus is the root um, uh, for us. And he wants to send his young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again in his shade and will flourish like the grain. He, he will blossom like a vine and his fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. O oh, Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I am like a green pine tree. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Who is wise? He will realize these things. Who is discerning? He will understand them. I just really like that verse there, verse 9. Who is wise and discerning? And if we are willing to let the Holy Spirit speak to us, um, and Jesus speak through the Holy Spirit to us um, with wisdom and discernment, then we will understand where these problem areas in our lives are coming from and how to be healed. 
Then in our closing verse is Malachi chapter 4. I read this often, but we need to know that this is the last day message for God's people. It's the Elijah message. It's the latter rain. This is the message of our day and of our time. And it says Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Don't we need the prophet Elijah to come here before Jesus comes? This is not John the Baptist now. This is before the great and dreadful day of the Lord that's coming. Okay? And what do you think the Elijah message is? I always thought that it was, you know, Elijah on Mount Carmel. And we are not going to worship Baal anymore. We're going to worship God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. We're going to choose God. That's the Elijah message, right? It is, but it goes deeper. For the last day generation, look what the Elijah message includes. It says in verse 6, He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. God wants to heal the families, things that happen between the fathers and the children and the mothers and the children. And our family unit, the families need to be healed. The families need to be cleansed. That's the message for our day, to bring about a healing so that we can be sealed with the living God, the, the seal of the living God. But we need this healing. And look at verse 2. In that same verse, it says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Jesus wants to heal our broken hearts. He wants to release us from the, the stalls that we're all trapped up in. He wants to heal our broken hearts from things that have happened to us that he never wanted to see happen to us. He wants to be our rescuer and our healer. Is that the desire of your heart? To go all the way with the cleansing while we're still living. He wants to cleanse our books, cleanse our lives, heal us and seal us. If that is your desire, then let us pray and ask the Lord for this miracle. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you see everything that's written in our books that you see the areas where we were hurt and where we were scared and where things we were separated from our parents or some separated from you in some sort of way and that we felt so grieved and sad and hurt that we self-protected in sinful ways. And Lord, you understand and you can take that cloth and wrap us up even though we're little babies and bleeding in some sort of way that the enemy has struck and, that, and bitten us, that you can heal us that you can have provided for us everything that we need. So we are coming to you broken and bleeding in some sort of way, Lord, and we ask for your healing touch, just as you touched the leper, just as you touched the blind man, or whatever it was, physical healing we need desperately, but more so we need heart healing. We just pray that you'll heal our hearts and write your law on our hearts and on our foreheads and seal us in with you. Thank you for your love and rescue plan. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.